my fair friends, I'm Ruby Ruse. This is Baby Bunny, and welcome to Fairy Fortunes. I know that I have a very subdued look, and I'm not very happy about it. <laughs> I do have a video that kind of explains why I've taken this form. So I will have that link down below. I had started uh, last year a video series, the ABCs of Mythology, and I unfortunately got waylaid, and, and I haven't made one in a while, but I did always want to go back and finish that series. And what's interesting is that I had left off with the letter J, which I had always uh, meant to be. J is for journey, and when I mean journey, I mean shamanistic journey. And what I found interesting is that I have been in a place and in, in time where I've been stuck at home, actually not because of the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, but for other reasons that I explain in a previous video that is linked down below, so I do hope you will check that one out too. And one of my very good friends, um, and teacher actually is the author Chris Allen and in regards to my situation he's like well you know this is the time where you can really go deep and explore things spiritually and do some journeying and I have and it has been something that has gotten me through the isolation and all of the, the things that are happening to me and to the world right now. So I really wanted to bring you, because I, I thought that talking about shamanistic journeying would be something that I could give to you and, and share with you, because this is an important experience for me, and it has meaning. So with that explanation now done, <laughs> all this words, I'm just kind of going off, to, off topic, but with that, I wanted to bring you J is for journey, the journey of the shaman. Um, so you may see me looking down from time to time. I, when I do these videos, I always have notes. So I, I like to have my notes. So if you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at. Uh, so I guess the best way to start this video after my long and drawn out tangent is to talk about the word shaman. And here's the truth of the situation, is that the word shaman actually might be a myth all on its own. The reality is, is that indigenous cultures actually never used the word shaman. It was a word coined to articulate a cultural phenomenon of esoteric healing and spiritual practice. So there really isn't a shaman. <laughs> it was a word that was coined by anthropologists, really, to describe these indigenous religions and their medicine people and their spiritual practices. So the word shaman is most likely Russian in origin and it is said to come from the Tus Tungustian tribe. And as I said, it was a word that was recorded by anthropologists. And the very earliest use of the word was in Europe in approximately 1692. So I do have reference links for you down below. So I do hope that you will check out my research that I did on this particular subject. So there's this idea. So the myth of the shaman, the myth that we have is that the shaman only refers to this isolated person of spirituality. This is a person that like lives naked in the jungle or in a cave and like is deeply spiritual and is kind of crazy. Like that's, that's the myth of what a shaman is. So what is shamanism today? So shamanism is very much a part of the pagan uh, umbrella movement of non-monotheist religion here and in the Western world today. So what shamanism is referred to today is a spiritual practice. And this spiritual practice is unique in its use of what is called ecstatic trance. 
And so what happens is a person practicing shamanism goes into a trance-like stage state in order to contact spirits or journey to spiritual or other worlds. And the reason that they do this is to find healing, knowledge, and guidance or hope for themselves and or others. There are incidences of shamans in mythology and of course I would like to bring up one of the most prominent uh, myths associated with the practice of shamanism and that is the sto one of Odin's story. Odin is from the Scandinavian uh, mytho mythological pantheon and there are a lot of misconceptions about what Odin's role is in that pantheon, so I'm just going to leave that. That's a whole another topic for itself. But what I found is that there are some interpretations of Odin's name as being translated to the master of ecstasy. And it refers back to that ecstatic trance state, is that he goes into this state of ecstasy where he is in this state where he is lets himself be almost overwhelmed by his senses and becoming ecstatic. So there are many many tales of Odin as being a traveler figure. So but when he would go on some of these journeys instead of actually being on a physical journey he would actually be said to be asleep or in almost a dead-like state. So there's this idea of going into yourself and becoming this ecstatic state is not like running around and screaming for joy, although that can be an ecstatic state. That actually can be a mode of, of shamanistic journeying. Um, but often when we think of taking a journey, when we think of taking a shamanistic journey, it is uh, going into like a dream-like state. Another thing that is very associated with shamanism is the idea of animal spiritual companions. So, not that, not that Bunny and I would know anything about spiritual animal companions. <laughs> Um, uh, so Odin, of course, he doesn't have a rabbit. He actually has two ravens that are associated with him. Um, they are reflectively named Hungen and Munin. So, but the most important myth that is associated with J is for journey, the journey of the shaman, is actually there is a very prominent story of Odin and his shamanistic journey. This story, in this story, Odin actually hangs himself from the world tree. The world tree is the great tree that is the pathway to the nine worlds. Uh, do check my links down below because I do have some references that will give you some more ideas about Norse mythology and the Scandinavian world of Odin and his other companions. But he hangs himself from this spiritual great tree, the world tree, Yggdrasil. And he actually takes a spear and he stabs himself with the spear. And he, he, it is said that he told people that he was going to stay there for nine days. And they were not to help him and they were not to give him any food or drink. And so he goes into um, this very almost overwhelming sensual experience where he's got the pain from being stabbed with the spear, he is dehydrated, he is lacking food, and he has blood rushing to his head from being hung upside down from the Yggdrasil tree. And in fact, in the tarot deck, the hangman card is often said to represent this ecstatic state of Odin as he hangs from the Yggdrasil. So as he's hanging from this tree, he goes into this trance and he has this understanding of the runes. 
the runes are a very powerful um, point of magic in the Norse uh, mystical tradition. And what's interesting is that the runes were not just used for divinational purposes, the runes actually were a system of language. So Odin from the story, the myth of Odin is that he then gave humanity the gift of language from this epic nine-day shamanic journey that he took from hanging himself down from the Yggdrasil tree. Odin, however, is not the only god uh, who has mythological stories associated with the journey of the shaman. Uh, but actually, where Odin learned some of his magic, how he was actually able to get the idea to hang from the Yggdrasil tree to how to bring humanity language, actually came from his teacher, the goddess Freya, who unfortunately, perhaps because she is female, uh, those stories just got um, pushed to the side. Um, and uh, so we don't have as much um, surviving myths of the goddess Freya. However, what we do know is that Freya was the goddess of seed magic. Now, seed magic is very much aesthetic magic. To seed is um, usually what you would do is that it's a very, this kind of action where you're bouncing gently. And the idea is that the motion and the repetitiveness can put you into a trance-like state. So, it, uh, so Freya was actually the goddess who taught Odin how to get to these the static, as I said, this is the state of ecstasy where you are having a complete sensor, sensory experience. That's what it means to me to have an ecstatic experience. So, as I said, um, being isolated as we are right now in uh, during the COVID-19 epidemic, um, although I was isolated before the pandemic broke out, um, and so it was suggested to me my, by my teacher that I should practice some journeying and, and really go deep with my spirituality, is that Definitely what I've been using, my journey of the shaman, my shamanistic journeying, is to seek healing for myself, not just for myself, but for the world at large. This is a scary time, and I'm trying to, to find understanding and get to a place of acceptance and get myself healthy. Now, what do I mean by this ecstatic journey? Like, it's great to, like, bounce, but why are we bouncing? Well, there is... And remember that I said that Odin took on this appearance of being almost dead when he would go on these journeys. A shamanic journey is a lot like daydreaming. So you don't necessarily have to bounce up and down, um, but you do want to quiet your mind and go into like a dreamlike state. The difference is is that when you dream, you often lose control of that dream. And that's fine because that's a whole different thing on its own. I have another video on dreaming, so I hope you'll check that out. Um, but with shamanistic dr journeying, what, what you're trying to do is with dreams, It is about rel relinquishing that control. That is part of the experience, is to be completely enveloped by that world of symbolism. In a shamanistic journey, though, you want to retain that control because you are going there with the express purpose of seeking some kind of knowledge or to have some kind of experience. So you don't necessarily want to go to sleep and relinquish control. So you do want to have kind of an active awareness. So I want you to think more of a shamanistic dream, uh, shamanistic journey as akin to a daydream. 
is that you are fully awake. So how, how do you journey? So I'm going to give you some examples of if you would like to try this spiritual practice for yourself. So that I find that if you want to be serious about taking a journey, it's best if you sit up or the, the reason for the seed magic of the gentle bouncing is that it keeps you awake. It engages all of your senses. As I said, an, a, a static trance is a sensory experience. You're using all of your senses. So I, I recommend that if you want to try shamanistic journey that you either sit in a chair in a meditation posture or that you try the little bouncing so that you do not fall asleep because it is very easy to fall asleep <laughs> if you lay down and try to do a shamanistic journey. So the easiest way to take a shamanistic journey is to imagine yourself inside a myth. For example, let's go back and let's use the myth of Odin and the runes. You could imagine yourself going to see Odin at the Yggdrasil tree. There are several different options that you could do to visit him. You could go to the foot of the tree and have a conversation with Odin as he's standing there. You could climb up the tree and you could sit on the branch that he's hanging from. And, or you could, if you even wanted to, if you wanted to, you could imagine yourself tying a rope to your feet and hanging down so that you could be face to face with Odin and have a conversation with him. So that is the easiest way to have a shamanistic journey. You're just going to take a little daydream trip. If you don't want to use a myth, you could even use your favorite story. Another one of my favorite authors uh, is Gede Parma, and he made mention that he often likes to visit the world of Oz. So he, in his mind's eye, he imagines himself getting in a balloon and going into the world of Oz with Dorothy Gale. So this is the very easiest way to have a shamanistic journey. So um, the a more advanced way of trying a shamanistic journey would be to go back into a dream. Now I have talked about this book on the channel before. I will try to link that video down below where I talk more about this video, about this book. But he actually has an exercise in this book called Dream Reentry. So I won't go too much into that because they, it is highlighted in this very good book by Robert Moss. But the basic practice of it is, is that you take a dream that is memorable to you, or maybe you woke up frightened and you can't really remember why you were frightened, or you have another type of emotion that you just don't quite remember. You can actually place yourself back into that dream. What you're doing is you're going into a daydream-like state, and you are re-experiencing that dream. What you can do with going back into the dream is so, for example, if there is a monster chasing you, which is often very common for many people, is that you can actually, in your daydream aspect of in your shamanistic journey, you can actually contain the monster in some way or form, or you can simply have a conversation with the monster either way, and that you're you'll gain knowledge, you can actually stop the monster and ask directly, why are you chasing me? What are you trying to teach me here? So that is a more advanced way of how you can perform a shamanistic journey. Now, the most difficult way actually to take a shamanistic journey, now people often think of meditation as just emptying your mind, that's actually a very highly, highly <laughs> developed form of uh, meditation. I don't recommend that for beginners. Likewise, I don't recommend this type of shamanistic journey, which is what everybody thinks of when they think of a journey. They think of Odin hanging upside down from that tree. They think of this indigenous spiritual leader um, in a sweat lodge having visions. That's actually a very advanced form of shamanistic journey. 
And that is called the free journey, where you place yourself in a meditative state or you do the seed magic, the seeding with the bouncing, and you just leave the experience open to whatever happens. And uh, that is a very advanced form. And the reason being is that that can be very um, challenging for people because they're expecting to have this great gnosis, to have this amazing experience. And what I found when I was doing a lot of this spiritual journey is sometimes I saw nothing. I had no images, I had no interactions. Um, sometimes it was just being in the center of myself. Sometimes I heard a word, um, these kinds of things. So it's important if you want to try doing shamanistic journey, which I encourage you to do, especially in this time of isolation that we're having, is that you really have to lower your expectations. You just have to let the experience be what it is. It is a sensory experience. You are allowing your senses to kind of go into overload. So you just allow yourself to have the experience that you have, and that can be very difficult to do. You just have to let go of your expectations. And, for example, if we use your favorite story or myth or the dream re-entry that I talked about, what you want the character to say may not be what the character actually says. So you have to lower your expectation. I think the greatest obstacle that I hear when it comes to not just the journey of the shaman, but magic in general, is that the question that I get people asking me all the time is, is it real or is it my imagination? And the answer is yes. <laughs> imagination is the cornerstone of magic. And in fact, you have to, in order to be able to manifest anything at all, even if you don't consider it magic, is imagination. You have to imagine it first. We would not have YouTube if somebody didn't imagine the possibility of it first. So imagination is real. What you are experiencing can be important. It is important. It is important. Let's say that you go to visit Odin and he tells you that what he'd really like to have is a bag of Doritos. <laughs> it's important. Maybe what that means for you is that you're missing the ability to go to the grocery store or you're missing uh, being at a party with your friends or maybe you have a bag of Doritos in your cupboard and you should eat them! I don't know! But all of these things do have meaning. They have meaning. So is it imagination or is it real? The answer is it's both. It's yes. It's, it is. It is your imagination. And yes, it is very, very, very real. And the purpose that I really want you to keep in mind is shamanism is really a way to show us interconnectivity. It's about thinking about, it. that's really definitely how I've been using it, is that I've really been trying to understand why things are the way they are right now. And it's not showing me, the shamanistic journey is not about, well, everything happens for a reason. I really don't believe that everything happens for a reason. But I do think that things are connected. And by taking the journey of the shaman, we can find those connections for ourselves. Because it's not about knowing the indefinite connection. This is why this happened. That's not necessarily what we're going to find when we journey as shamans. We are finding the connection within ourselves. We are finding out what it means to us. And that kind of leads me to the final thing. And this really comes from 
once again my work with Chris Allen and his work Underworld which I highly recommend. Chris Allen makes it clear that when we practice shamanism, when we go on these journeys, is that really the goal is to seek to be better than you are. You are seeking how to be the best version of yourself. If you would like to learn more about shamanism, actually the best book that I can re recommend on that subject, if you are a beginner to shamanism, I highly recommend this book, Singing the Soul Back Home. This is by Caitlin Matthews. Uh, this is a little bit difficult to find, um, but you can find it on uh, Amazon usually sold by other sellers and there are two versions of this book so you may not find this particular cover on it but uh, the author is Caitlin Matthews so I will make sure that there is a link down below to a Goodreads or Amazon version of this book but this is a great great book on shamanism for beginners then once you've tackled this I also highly recommend um, Underworld and the other works by Chris Allen Chris Allen is based in Chicago. Um, during the pandemic, he is offering a lot of different classes, so I will try to have a link to his page down below so that you can register for some of his works because there now is the time to practice shamanism, I think, is that we need to journey deep into ourselves. Seek to be better than we are. I think that's the message of the times. And with that, have a fairyful day.